Today we're going to talk about Leslie's meta-representational model of pretense and its relationship to theory of mind. What is mind reading? Well, mind reading can be characterized in very general terms as the capacity to make sense of other people's behavior in psychological terms, such as beliefs, desires, intentions, and the like. And this is something that cognitive scientists have been wanting to explain for a long time. So some questions for cognitive science in this regard would be, well, how can we give a theoretical account of these practical abilities? Or can we give a neural account of the localization of these abilities in, in the brain? Well, Leslie's account is, uh, deals with this first question, in order to give a theoretical account of these practical abilities. And his theory relates mind reading to pretense. There are many angles. For instance, in developmental psychology, you have the theory of pretense in all the work around the false belief task. In primate cognition, you have a work by Prem David Premack on the chimpanzee theory of mind. On uh, developmental psychopathology, you have work on developmental disorders such as autism that are thought to be connected with problems in mind reading. And on uh, evolutionary psychology, you have the work on uh, the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis and mind reading as a, as a module. Now, we're going to today to talk about theory of pretense as a springboard to the theory of mind and uh, mind reading. And so why is it interesting? Well, mind reading is often taken to require a very distinctive kind of thinking. It involves thinking about other people's thoughts, which is, merely, which is more complex than merely thinking about objects in the world. And so the concept, in particular, we're going to see that Leslie uh, links the notion of mind reading with uh, meta representation. Other terms for this are second order thinking, re reflexive thinking, and secondary representations. So, uh, Leslie is a British psychologist who has published a lot on this topic, and we're going to discuss his 1987 paper. And again, is about the origins of meta representation. And uh, his target is that what he wants to explain is pretend play, what sorts of uh, symbolic abilities give rise to pretend play. So we know that uh, pretend play em emerges very early in infancy, about 13 months, and in uh, normal children it gets fairly sophisticated by the end uh, of, the, of the second year. So pretend play is acting as if, say, something is when it is not. And it is a stepping stone in the child's development that leads to full-blown theory of mind abilities, even though pretend play emerges much earlier than fully-fledged theory of mind. So you have pretend play in place much before children can pass the false belief task, for instance. In any case, Leslie thinks that pretend play is a forerunner to the kind of thinking that is required for the development of a theory of mind. So you have different kinds of pretend play. You have self-directed, which is simply pretending to carry out a familiar activity, you have other directed, which is pretending that some object has some properties that it doesn't. For instance, that a glass that is empty, you pretend that it has water or tea. And object substitution is pretending that some object is a different object, say that a banana is a telephone. So it seems that pretend play requires the child to coordinate multiple perspectives. That is to hold two realities about what is the same thing in his mind. That is a patient or a teddy bear. She has to think of the real object and also about what she's supposed to imagine that the object is, right? In addition to that, she not only has to think about herself. So suppose that when she sees her mother do this some kind of pretending, as mothers sometimes do, and other children do, well, she must understand what's going on in her mother's mind or in the other child's mind in order to understand the pretense. So one of the researchers who has closely linked the theory of mind and pretense is Alan Leslie. His approach is squarely within the classical cognitivist tradition in cognitive science, and he says so himself, as you can see from various quotations like this. So in order to explain the, the phenomena, he will say what kinds of mental representations the children are using, and what sort of computations they are applying on them. In order to relate this to other things we've seen in the, in the course, you can see the account as trying to characterize the representations and operations of the physical symbol system inside the child's head as well as the nature of the code Europe it operates on, like the language of thought. So keep this in mind as you follow along. Now, Leslie starts from the observation that pretend play requires sophisticated abilities to represent the world. This must include the child's primary representations, whose aim, more or less, is to represent the world as accurately as needed. This includes perceptions, memories, 
etc. And since we're working in Leslie's classical framework, these primary representations, in order to take part in the individual's uh, mental economy, must be present in some kind of mental code, like a language of thought, right, which we saw with Fodor. So one question Leslie asks is, does pretense require representations to be present in another code? That is, must there be a, a second language of thought to be used in pretense, but not in literal thinking? So here we have a, a, a little girl pretending that the, the banana is a telephone. So is it that primary representations must change their meaning when the child engages in pretense, such that the telephone symbol is, no longer stands for telephones, but now also includes bananas, for instance? Well, Leslie thinks that it is unnecessary to postulate a second code just to explain pretense. And he also thinks that primary representations must keep their original meaning. Well, it's not that the child is deluded in thinking that the banana is indeed a telephone. So pretense is clearly different from error. Here you have to juggle both fantasy and reality. However, he still has some explaining to do. There has to be some difference between how things are represented in pretense and outside pretense. Otherwise, the child's representation of the world would be chaotic and contradictory. So this is what I mean. Suppose that the child perceives this glass and sees it and believes that it is empty. So she has, again, in her language of thought, in her physical symbol system, an active representation to the effect that the glass is empty. But suppose that the child is also pretending to drink from the glass. Now, inside her pretend game, the glass cannot be empty. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense for her to drink from it. So, somewhere in the child's mind, her actions must be guided by the representation of the proposition the glass is not empty, or something to that effect. But if so, then the child would both hold that the glass is empty, and that it is not empty, thus generating an obvious internal conflict. So, the internal representation system as a whole would not be able to accurately represent reality which betrays the very purpose of primary representations. So, if there is no second code, and if primary representations do not need to have their interpretations modified, then what happens to primary representations in pretense play? <laughs>